everybody, it's Carrie with Seed to Spoon. So I just wanted to shoot a quick intro, just telling you a little bit about what this upcoming video is. So Dale and I had the pleasure of um, going and speaking downtown at Scissor Tail Park. And um, today, this morning, we were actually just down there. We brought two of our baby goats down there with us. We had fun. We talked all about growing food in the winter. Um, so how we extend food into the growing season. Um, so we talked a little bit about our PVC dome greenhouses, showed those. And then we talked a lot about the things that we're growing in smart pots right now. So we talked about a lot of herbs and greens and lots of things. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what's coming up. So this is the class that we taught um, earlier today. I hope you all enjoy. Let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Dale, this is my family, uh, my wife Carrie, uh, a couple of our goat kids as well. If y'all want to hang out with them, they're going to be right over here in that white right pickle goats area. So they're, they're basically dogs, a couple more of them. Uh, this one's Thumper here, and Jeffrey is right over here. So, um, today we're going to be talking about growing food in the fall and in the winter. So a lot of people don't realize that fall is a great time to grow food. It gets definitely more difficult in the winter, but there are things you can be doing throughout the winter to make it where uh, you have a successful harvest real early in the spring. So we're going to talk about kind of all of that stuff today. All right, the goats are the goats are going over there. So if you want to see the goats, head on over. All right, so I'm going to take you through basically what we've been doing the past couple months. So starting back, we'll start at the beginning of October because most all of our crops got wiped out by chickens at the end of September. So we started over in, in the beginning of October, uh, solved the chicken problem. Check out our YouTube if you want to see any of this stuff, because Carrie's been documenting it all uh, over the past 30 days, like everything we've been doing every day. So about a month ago, we started a bunch of seeds for lettuce and kale and spinach, and that's going pretty strong right now. So it's already about three or four inches tall, like it's going to be good to go. It's already at the stage that we're trying to get all of our greens to. And really, like the, the overall point of what you're trying to do right now is get plants to the stage where they can survive a winter. You're not going to get a ton of food out of them right now. You might get some micro greens. You might get some like little harvests of lettuce or something. But really, your goal is to get these plants to survive the winter. And then February, you're going to start getting harvest off. So otherwise, you're not going to get to harvest off the greens till April or May. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is related to that. Um, I want to pause a little bit just to introduce uh, kind of who, who we are and, and how we got into this. We, we started growing food in 2015, 14, 15, we started growing food and we had like just a regular backyard at that time and we converted the entire backyard into gardens and I got obsessed with gardening and and we built our app to make it easy for other people to grow food. So if you don't have it, check it out. It's called From Seed to Spoon. Uh, we've got we have a laptop with the sleeve. We'll look back. It'll be a, you can see kind of our website where you can download it. Um, shout out, Justin is here today. Justin is our, our lead developer that helped architect all the hard stuff. If there was anything hard with Seed to Spoon, Justin is the one that thought about how to do it. He is an amazing programmer, so shout out to Justin. But, um, so our app helps you grow over 100 different foods, gives you plenty yeah. days based on where you live. Uh, it does a whole lot of stuff. So, yes, you have a question? Yes. So the question is, is everything we're starting need to be in a greenhouse? So let's go ahead and jump in there. So um, technically, no. Spinach and kale can survive the winter unprotected. It's iffy though, depending on, especially when we have these Oklahoma winters where it goes from 80 to 20 to negative 13 to 70, it's just all just back and forth. The plants don't have time to prepare for those cold temperatures, and that's what ultimately kills them. So pretty much all of our gardens in the winter are going to have leaves over them. So imagine with me for you, Will, this is in the ground. We have rebar. Here, you got a piece of rebar. So we take this, these rebar pieces, and put them in the ground in all four corners around one of our big bag beds or like a group of smart pots together. But it looks basically like this. And then we take plastic sheeting. And all this stuff is bought from like Home Depot, PVC pipe, plastic sheeting. Put and drape that over that. And then we have these clips that hook it into place. And we've like detailed all of this on our YouTube channel showing us building it, like all the steps on that. So if you want to see how to, how to, how to build these, check that out. But we have one of these over pretty much anything we're trying to get through the winter because it dramatically increases your odds of 
stuff survived in the winter. Also, you get harvest deeper into the winter. So we'll get spinach and kale into like January sometimes. Yeah, these and they're so cheap to build. It's just half inch PVC pipe with some larger PVC pipe that like, goes over. I mean, it's, it's just real simple stuff. So um, you can also build them larger. You can build something like that out of like a cattle panel. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to save money. We, I mean, we don't have like a large greenhouse or anything like that. We do a bunch of these. And so one thing we've done in the past too is we built them on a hinge. So if you just affix this to a two by four foundation and then put that on a two by four frame below with some hinges, then it's, you can just like lift it up and harvest. Um, I would love to get to that point with our, our new place that we moved out to last year, but it's it's five acres and we're growing a ton. Like this is just the easiest way for us to cover everything. Eventually we'll get to the point where we have hinges and all that kind of stuff again, but it's not too bad to harvest out of here. You just kind of lift one corner and pull it up. Yes, go ahead. Like a water trough above, so um, so you do deal with issues with freezing more. So like these three gallon smart pots, whoever wins these today, bring them indoors at night on the like super cold nights because there's not enough soil to insulate those roofs, right? But in our big bag beds, there's plenty of soil. That's basically the same as a four by four raised bed. So um, and other things I've done, if I have crops I'm really I'm really worried about or I really want to help through, I'll just like put straw bells around it to insulate it. I just do stuff like that. There's, and also, like you can do two layers of one of these. So you can build one smaller one and then one bigger one. And that double layer of protection like changes your zone by two, basically. So you go from seven to nine, which means you can... So this isn't for like peppers or tomatoes or anything like that. This is just for stuff that already does well in the cold, just to help it survive a little bit longer and produce, produce earlier. Yeah, so the double greenhouse thing definitely works well. So, um, all right, so let's talk about what you can plant now, right? So it's not too late to get herbs in the ground. Right now is actually a great time to get herbs in the ground because if you plant herbs in the spring and it gets too hot too quick, they can not, sometimes they can not keep up with the heat and they, they, they end up drying out and dying. But when you plant them in the fall, they get all winter to establish their roots. And as long as you water them consistently throughout the winter, you're going to have a ton of herbs you know, come in the spring that you can harvest from. So let's talk through some of our favorite herbs to grow, because herbs honestly are one of my favorite things to grow. Whenever you first start, whenever we first started growing food, we were getting a lot of harvest and things like uh, squash and, and, and stuff like that. And it was very exciting for the first few weeks. And then it was like, I'm tired of eating squash. Like, this is not going to last if we don't figure out how to make this taste different. And that's where herbs really came in because you can add oregano to squash one day and then rosemary to squash the next day and it tastes dramatically different, right? And it makes it where you have a lot of different variety in your foods. That's like the, that was the gateway that got me into herbs. But then once I learned more about the medicinal value of herbs and the health benefits that come with them, that really got me hooked. Because when you buy like the little Italian seasoning from the store, that is not going to have anything in it that's useful for you. It's, it's oftentimes like the oregano isn't even real oregano. It's a fake version of oregano that tastes like oregano because it's easier to grow. So you're not even getting the help in it if it's oregano when you buy oregano a lot of the time. You're getting a cheap knockoff. And not only that, but stuff in the store has already lost its potency by the time it's going in your body. So whenever you eat these herbs fresh, it is the best way to get all the nutrients from that plant directly into you. And you can think of it as like eating your multivitamins, right? And studies have shown that these herbs have dramatically uh, improved immune systems and heart functions and all sorts of stuff like that. So um, check out our app. Carrie is, is a nurse and her, um, the, the big thing that she helped with in the app is she built this database of health benefits. So for each plant, it lists out the health benefits that that plant helps with. And you can also filter by health benefits. So if you want to see everything that helps with heart health or diabetes or um, whatever it is, you can choose that and it'll show you all the plants that help with that. So check that out in the app. It's up here, this right here, this list. I don't know if you can all see the TV. Is it? Okay, cool. So this is like this uh, health benefits here. You can tap on one that shows you all the plants. And then once you tap on a plant, it'll it'll take you through. And we'll go through and show that here in a minute. We'll go through and show how you can actually log things in your garden. So if you're not sure when you're going to go harvest out of things, stuff like that, our, our app will actually help calculate that for you and do all that kind of stuff. So, um, so let's talk about some of these herbs specifically. So rosemary is my favorite herb. Um, 
it is very, it, it, it does pretty well in Oklahoma as long as we don't get these random swings in temperatures, right? So if you're gonna get, if you see it's gonna be like 70 one day and then zero the next day, help that rosemary out by either protecting it with putting something over it or bringing it indoors or something like that. I love to use it on meats, things like that. Uh, it's, it's pretty slow growing, so it takes a, a little bit to start getting harvest out of it. But in a few months, you'll, uh, especially coming in the spring, like once it, once it comes up in the spring, you're going to have more than enough to start harvesting off of it at least a couple times a week. Um, it's not as fast growing as something like sage or, I mean, not, not sage. Sage is very similar to rosemary. It's not as fast as like something like thyme or oregano or anything like that. Uh, you may notice the one thing missing from everything from you see here is basil. Do not buy basil right now. I, I was in the store the other day and saw basil at basil farts. Don't do that. It's going to die. It would die. Or maybe it's really when the temperatures get below about 55 when basil starts going down. So um, if you come up, by the way, and you haven't got a ticket, raise your hand and we'll, we'll go around my daughter and Daphne over here. We'll give you a ticket. We're giving away all these plants that you see planted over here. Um, we're all going to go home with you all today. So um, stick around for that. We'll be doing that at about 10 or so. Uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand. We're happy to do something. Yes, sir. about propagation so propagation is a great thing to do right now as well so that means if you have an established plant so if you have an oregano or rosemary uh, something that has those hard woody stems now is the perfect time to start going through and making new plants from those so we have like the videos on our youtube that detail this but i'm going to talk through it but if you want to see it visually go check that out basically you just find the growth on the rosemary and you don't want to do this on a baby rosemary this is going to be on one that's already been through a year and is already like been through winter right but then you start snipping off the softest shoots from it and then you strip off the bottom leaves and they have this stuff, uh, root hormone, you can get, it's very cheap, it's a couple dollars and you just dip the, the, the down into there. Technically you don't have to use it but it really helps out. It's a natural hormone that, that tells the plant to grow roots. So you, you put that um, in a little soil in a container of like peat moss or something like that. You don't want to do anything with like compost or anything like that because the plant isn't ready for that yet and the fungus and stuff can sometimes get to it. So you just want to do something real basic and sanitary, like some sort of seed starting mix or peat moss or something like that. And then uh, give it about three or four weeks and um, it'll start to grow roots. And at that point, you can transfer it over to a larger pot and then kind of nurse it through the winter. Um, and we do a lot of growing indoors in the winter. So I want to talk about that a little bit. We have two different setups. We have one that's kind of a larger setup that's out in like our, our shop, you know, shed area that is just five wire racks. You know, like the standard wire racks you see in the store, they're like $80 and they're probably way more now if everything's on that. But um, they used to be $80 the last time I bought one. Um, and then we get shop lights and then hang them on each level. So we've got like four, the five wire rack, we've got four racks of, of, of shop lights going. And then below each one of those shop lights, you have trays of the 10 by 20 going. And we have links to all this on our website too. I don't know if used for this. Um, but we have those on, on, each, on each shelf and we are able to grow a ton of microgreens throughout the winter. So if you aren't familiar with microgreens, it's basically baby versions of plants. So things like broccoli, uh, kale, radish, beets, sunflowers, like there's a lot of really cool things people grow as microgreens. And you basically just fill like a little 10 by 20 tray with uh, a seed starting mix. Again, not one that's like the compost, it's like a real sterile one. And then you just blanket the entire thing with seeds. Um, like you cover the whole thing with seeds because you're, you're only gonna grow it like this fall when you harvest. So you just keep that moist for a couple days. And on kale, you'll have a harvest in about seven to 14 days depending on the variety. Um, depending on the plant, like it dictates how long before you have a harvest from it. But we have just rotations of, go of those going throughout the winter. Um, we also have another setup inside the house that is just a smaller little like tabletop. Uh, I wish I would have ever bought it, but every time I bought it somewhere, I break a book, so it's probably good. Um, so it's just one of those little tabletop growing stations, right? We have that in the house. That's cool because the kids get to see it like very evolving and it makes it, you know. Um, and those are the things that we use most in the kitchen will happen, will happen there. So that's most of, of what we're growing through the winter is stuff like that. You can also go through and plant like fruit bushes and fruit trees and things like that. Um, now is the time to plant that as well. And if you don't mind moving things indoors and outdoors a bit, 
then you can really do some more stuff. So things like lettuce. Like if you have lettuce in one of these little three gallon smart pots, or like uh, something like these 10 gallons aren't too bad to move in and out. Um, Carrie's mom actually had like some of these smart pots inside of like wheelbarrow container things so she can move them in and out from like a garage or something like that, right? So if you're willing to do something like that, then you could grow a lot of other things deeper into the winter. So anything that's listed as cool season, if you go into the app and you go to the bottom down here, you can go to additional filters, you can filter by cool season and it'll show you all the plants that are, are meant to grow in the cool season. If you plant by, if you filter by can be planted, it's gonna tell you nothing. It's technically around the season, but doing these kind of tricks and stuff, you can extend the season. So filter by cool season and then you can see those. Okay, let's go ahead and do a giveaway. Uh, so, if you don't have a ticket, you want some napkin here. Last call for tickets. Where's the video? Okay, so I'm going to start calling out numbers. So, if you uh, if I call your number, raise your hand, make some noise. The last three digits, 432. We got a winner right here. So, come up and pick whatever plant you would like. And if we haven't talked about that plant, we'll start talking about it. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, not the big ones, I'm sorry. The, any of the ones that have the plants in them. Rosemary, all right, we talked about rosemary already, so we'll talk about that one. So you should know. If you're in place with that rosemary, though, let me know, okay? Thank you. Yep, all right, another one. That's 417. going stretches without rain and then getting a ton of rain it likes brutal heat and then brutal cold like it's built for Oklahoma. So oregano is a great plant to start with and out of all the things you can add to your diet it is one of the things that has the most amount of health benefits. So it's also something you can feed your dogs like we mix it in with uh, our dog foods or we feed a lot of stuff from the house to the dogs so we throw in oregano with that for them. Um, it's just one of the one of the easiest things to grow. It's also something that's going to help your other plants so if you plant the ground tomatoes or peppers in the spring, it'll keep pests away from those tomatoes and peppers. The reason for that is because these herbs like oregano and sage and these like really fragrant herbs put out a lot of scent into the air and that confuses pests that are looking for like tomatoes or peppers because they're looking based on their sense of smell. So that's why we have these plants that scattered all around our garden, we mix around all sorts of stuff like that. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Sage. sage, all right, sage. So sage and I have a bit of a story. So um, I did not like sage when I first started growing it, but in, the, in, in, in June, it produces these flowers that are just amazing. Like if you are having an anxiety attack, you can go sniff those flowers and it instantly calms you down. Like they are amazing. So that was how I first started like realizing sage has some potential. And then we uh, made pesto from it. And that kind of changed the game for us because it's our favorite type of pesto. So if you've never made pesto, it's really simple. You just take the leaves of the plant, um, probably a handful. Again, the, the sage bush is going to get really big. It's going to be like three or four feet tall. Like It's going to be like a big bush. It's going to have a ton of, of, of leaves coming off of it. Um, so at that point, you can take handfuls of it, take it inside, take the, the sage leaves, take some garlic, take some uh, what pine, nuts. pine nuts, and then, um, olive oil. Take all of that. We have a recipe for it on our website, so if you want to know exactly how it's called that. You can play with it, though. You can make it, just, you can make it however you want. Um, just put all that in a food processor, and it's amazing. You can put that on everything. So sage is our, if you can do that with 
oregano, you can do it with basil, obviously, is what most people know as pesto. Um, but you can do it with any of these herbs. Um, it's just more difficult on things like pine because like the leaves are so small. You're gonna spend a lot of time picking leaves in order to get some pesto. Uh, so there's always a time joke when we talk about it. Um, and then sage is, is awesome because you get so many leaves from it. So um, any other questions before I think of another? Yes, which question? What, what's that? You never can give her growing sage or like herbs and stuff like that? Okay. So the key for herbs like this, the key to get them growing, number one is do not overwater them. So through the winter, like for the next month, you're gonna be watering it a lot, right? Come spring, back down on it. Um, water once a week. Water really deep once a week. So don't water it for like, you know, five minutes every day. That's gonna encourage roots to stay in like the top section of the soil. If you water really deep and then wait a while, well, it's still gonna be, you're still gonna water down like six inches, right? So it's gonna keep searching for water. And doing that continually is gonna really encourage those roots to grow deep and to be more established. So that if there's droughts or whatever, it's not gonna be as effective, right? That's the, that's the first thing you can do. Um, also make sure you're adding compost. So they don't need a ton of fertilizer, but they will benefit from the compost. So add in compost, like I, I typically add in in the fall and in the spring with my herbs. I don't add any in the summer, they seem to do fine. But in the spring, I give them a boost, and then at the end, uh, I give them a little boost. But I'm just doing compost. Um, I wouldn't give them fertilizer going into the winter, because that's gonna encourage them to grow more leaves, and then definitely have an issue in the winter. So those are the biggest mistakes people typically make, is like planting directly in the ground. Like these herbs do way better in containers than they do in the ground, because they're able to dry out faster, and they're, uh, they don't keep their feet wet, as it's called. You know, they don't have their roots soaked in the water. So. You're in like them, the troughs, the water trough type things? Oh, the raised bed boxes? Yeah, okay, well that's great then. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's where they should be. Um, just make sure you don't water them too much. Does that sound like maybe that's what happened? Okay, cool. Any other questions for anybody? Oh, um, good robot or for potpourri? Um, accidentally, sure. I mean, like, I'll harvest too much sage and bring it inside and it stays on the counter and smells good for a while, so. But it's never a plan. Our lives are chaotic. It's never a plan for anything. We're always running to do something with an animal or, or try to edit a video or something, so. <laughs> We're not coordinating enough for potpourri, but maybe one day. Any other questions? All right, let's talk about more of these plants and let's maybe start, uh, let's give away a few more. So I see some mint up here. Let's start talking about that. And, uh, 444. 420. 420. 450. Yeah. 428. 435. Alright, call your number. Come on up, take a plan, and tell me what you pick so we can talk about it. More sage and rosemary. I sold sage and rosemary too hard. Nobody, nobody wants anything else. Alright, I'll talk about mint and why you should get mint then, okay? I'm gonna try and sell this mint plant for free. Um, okay, so mint is awesome to grow to have a drink in the summer. That's like the number one reason I use mint is in the summer when it's really hot, I like to get some mint leaves and put them in some water, soak it for like a, make a tea basically, right? And then drink that. It's very refreshing and it cools you down. That is my number one use for mint. We have dabbled with making like toothpaste and all that kind of stuff with it, but it's always been not as good as what we can get before. So that's never stuck. Uh, you can try that if you want. You can also make like essential oils and stuff like that from it. It takes a whole lot to do it. Um, you can do all that kind of stuff too. We, I think we've used mint to flavor things. Didn't we try flavoring some chocolate chip cookies with mint? Did we? we did, and we tried some ice cream. Ice cream, did it work? Okay, I don't like that stuff, unless I'm drinking it. So she, that, she says it works. So anyway, if you get to pick one, like, check out that mint. I did not really talk about Swiss chard. And I want to talk about it, because it's Carrie's favorite thing to grow in the fall and the winter. And we didn't really like chard in the beginning until we figured out how to eat it. So if you've never had chard before, it's a very strong flavor. And when I tried to eat it like spinach, I was like, this is gross. Like eating a whole bowl of it, you know, like don't do that. That's not how you eat chard. Um, well, maybe some people do. It's not how I can eat chard. 
Um, the way that we use chard is basically as a replacement for a tortilla. So every now and then we do like a run of like three or four months of keto. And during that time, like we're avoiding carbs, right? And this is really one of the keys for helping us do that because we replace tortilla wraps with like giant leaves of Swiss chard or collard greens. The kale will get big enough eventually for that. Uh, some of the spinach varieties, Giant Noble gets big enough for it. So all of those different things we're using as like just tortilla replacements. So sometimes I'll mix them, so I'll put like one Swiss chard and one spinach, right? And then use that and then put it in a mixture of like rice or you know, like you know, chicken or you know, whatever you know, we're putting it in, in, at that time. So um, that's my number one way that we use Swiss chard. It's also beautiful. Um, see. There's all these different colors here. Yeah, it's super pretty. And <laughs> I feel like because it's so pretty, this is the bright white variety. So I feel like because it's so pretty, the kids are really like to eat it. So it encourages them. They're like, ooh, I'll take a pink one. So yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why we love this so much. You like parsley too. You want to talk about that? Um, you like parsley more than I do, so I'll let you talk about it. Um, so parsley is one that we use it a lot in, especially in couscous. We have a couscous recipe where we, we bring some of these leaves in, and we chop them up, and we mix them up into the couscous, and we add like raisins and some almonds. It tastes amazing. So I, we love parsley. That is probably one of the main things that we use parsley for. So what else about parsley? Yeah. Yeah. It also has a lot of health so it's one of those things where like if one of us starts feeling like you're coming out sick, we start making like emergency broths. We so we'll have chicken broth and then all these herbs make that up. And just drink like a whole half of it in one of the day. Like that's like so like a lot of these herbs that's what we use them for too. Is we can have on cases or stuff like that. Alright, so let's let's draw some more winners. 441. 439. I need to shake the window. 441. Got one? Woo! And then 439. 421. I think so. Okay, so you pick time, so let's talk about time. I think we talked about it a little bit. Time is something that is very easy to grow, it's very similar to oregano in that it, uh, it really tolerates our conditions here well. There's a lot of different varieties of thyme. Um, so there's like a lemon thyme, there's an orange thyme. Uh, there's, like I said, there's like 12 different varieties of thyme that I've had at one point. So uh, I really like the lemon thyme. I, lose, I use it a lot with fish. It's also the, uh, it's probably the, uh, the, the best herb to start with cooking because it, if you put too much in it, it doesn't destroy a dish like if you put too much sage. Like if you put way too much sage in something, you'll hate sage for a year and a half. At least I did. Same with her with rosemary. I made her hate rosemary for like a year. I put like way too much of it on the steak. So um, that's the downside of some of those. But thyme is a pretty safe one. And we use it like as much as we use salt basically. So like french fries and all sorts of stuff that we're making like if you put salt on, we also put thyme on. Um, it has a ton of health benefits as well. Six. I 
talk about everything we have up here yet? We haven't talked about chives. Oh my goodness. Okay, so chives are. I've said this about regular and time, and I'll say this about chives now. So if there's three things that you want to start growing right now, start with those three. Chives might be top of the list though, because they are the easiest thing to grow, even easier than oregano, and they will reproduce like crazy. So you will get a ton of chives off of that plant. Not necessarily like right now, but by next year it'll, it'll really be going and then you can divide it to like, to move it to new spots. So once you have chives, you'll always have chives. Um, they're very similar to onions, but it's a different type of plant. So they don't produce bulbs like onions do. So like, I know you've seen, you can take an onion to the store and take it home, put it in the grass, it grows the top, right? That doesn't taste near as good as the chives do. Uh, and that's why I didn't understand when I first got in the garden. I was like, why do I need chives if onions do the top? Well, there's two big reasons for it. Right? One, those taste way better. There's also different flavors of it, so like garlic chives. Um, uh, but really, like the, the bigger reason why you don't want to do that is if you start chopping leaves off your onion plants, they're not going to make bulbs as big, and they may not even survive if you do it too much. They don't really make for that. So you want to have both types of onions. You want to have onions and you want to have chives. You can start onions now as well, technically, like by seed, because onions and garlic, and I have to put garlic on it, but too, they both need to go through a winter in order to produce in the spring. So if you plant them in the spring, you're not going to get big bulbs out of either one of them um, if you start them from seed. So with onions, typically what people do is, is you buy them from the nursery in the spring as these little like already started plants. So those little bundles of onions that you see that you buy, those are pl onion plants that somebody started in the fall and then bunched them all together and then sold to you in the spring, right? You can do that same thing yourself if you want to start onion seeds. So if you'd rather skip having to buy the onion uh, transplants, you can do that. We've never done that. We always buy our onions. I really like the Dixondale onions that come from Texas. Um, and they are always sold around here in different countries. So I usually just buy those and do a bunch of transplanting of those. But if you want to do seeds for onions, you can start those now. But you do have to do garlic. Uh, you do have to start it now. And now is the best time to start garlic. So it's really simple. You just get garlic from the store. I recommend trying to get organic garlic simply because uh, if it's not organic, they may have sprayed something on it to keep it from sprouting. You're trying to sprout it, so that's counterproductive. So um, that's the biggest reason why we try to find organic garlic. We are also huge nerds and we like to collect garlic. So like every time we see a new grocery store, we're like, they might have a new variety we don't have. So we like pop in and try to buy some. Um, so it's a fun game to play if you want to get into the garlic game. There is an elephant garlic that's huge. It is amazing to grow. That's probably my favorite. <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, we've seen that at Crest before. I can't. Yeah. You got a goat emergency? No, she's a ghost. Oh, she's ghost. Plain. Okay. Ghost, ghost. Okay. Um, so garlic, uh, again, buy it from the store. It'll come in that big, I don't remember what it's called, ball the clove. The big part of the garlic, you crush it, you get the small parts, you plant the small parts with the pointy side, with the root side down and the pointy side up. That's as simple as it is. Again, we have videos on our YouTube that document all this from everything we do in our garden. If you want to find us on social media or online or anything, just search for From Seed to Spoon. Um, if, you, if you want to search in the app store, it's also under From Seed to Spoon. Our website is seedtospoon.net. And we have an app that's completely free. It's on iOS and Android. Uh, it makes growing food really easy. It calculates planting days based on where you live. Um, it shows you all the information we've talked about today is in that app. Um, videos, like all that kind of stuff all pulls, pulls into the app. Um, pest information. So a great thing about growing in the fall is there really aren't a lot of pests, but in the spring that will all change because we're in Oklahoma and pests are everywhere here and uh, they can be pretty difficult. So uh, the app shows ways you can handle those organically or with using um, things maybe you hadn't thought of. So instead of using poisons for rodents and stuff, we, um, you know, for, for like, uh, we use like both activated sprinklers just to uh, scare things away. And, like, there's a lot of different things like that that, that we use that, uh, that make it easy to grow food. So um, any other questions? Got anything specific before we give away the rest of these plants? Are there anything we want to talk about? Questions? Yes. Tomatoes. Yes, I'll talk about tomatoes. Please do not plant tomatoes right now, though. You have to promise me you won't do that. Uh, so tomatoes are, if you haven't had success growing tomatoes in Oklahoma, try growing a cherry tomato. The, those are the easiest ones to grow in Oklahoma. Um, because they don't take as long to produce fruit. 
the problem you're finding in Oklahoma is that if there's like a week of solid rain every day in the summer, which happens, it's going to ruin pretty much all the fruit that you've got because they're going to form, like it's going to flush out the calcium, you're going to see the calcium in the, the, the Boston in rot, you're going to have all sorts of issues like this that are really hard to control in Oklahoma. Now these smart pots make it a lot better, so like we have our tomatoes inside of one of these giant smart pots like that. Um, you know, like a 25 gallon over here or something like that. That's where we grow our tomatoes in and it helps a lot because they have all that extra soil to help regulate kind of what's going on and they're not going to drown in too much water, right? Because they're all it's, it's above the ground. So like a raised bed will work for that too. Uh, container planting really comes into play with tomatoes. So I surround my tomatoes with basil. Uh, it's usually the number one thing I plant around them. Um, you can do oregano or stuff like that, but like basil and tomato just like go together. There's a reason why they're paired together culinary because it's they've been grown together for a long time because they help each other out. The basil improves the flavor of the tomatoes. Honestly, I don't know what the tomato does for the basil. I think it's a one-sided relationship, but, but the basil helps the tomato. So um, so those are really the keys. Also, you've got to really watch for the tomato hornworm. It's a giant worm that is shockingly hard to find sometimes because it blends in so well with the plant. Um, check out the app and have a big picture. It's a giant green worm with a big horn on the front of its head. It doesn't do anything, but it looks scary. Um, but we have we feed those to our chickens. So um, if you don't have chickens, you can feed them wild birds. You can train the birds to come eat them. Like we used to have this bird feeder and put them up in there. And then, yeah. um, so, oh, you had a question too? Yes. Um, so, in regards, so you guys don't get your houses sprayed out here? For no. No, we don't spray at all or anything like that. Yeah, what are some solutions? Can I find that on the website? Because we don't spray either. Well, solutions for what types of this or of issues specifically? Because I think it is going to be a little bit different. Spiders. Spiders. Well, see, here's like, I'm going to start and sell you an idea here. Spiders are the friend. There's only a couple of them you don't want around. Like, so if the brown recluse or a black widow, get rid of those. But all the other spiders are gonna help you. Like that's what gets rid of all the bad bugs. So the way I look at it is our garden is a war zone between good and evil of the bug world, okay? And if I start wiping out good bugs, if I start wiping out all the bugs, well, the bad bugs I mean, have kind of been built in a way that they're able to come back faster than the good bugs. Good bugs take longer to get going, right? They're always they're like the Jedi's, they're always from stuff behind, right? Like, you're always chasing something going on, right? That's kind of how it works, where the bad, the bad population builds up first, and then eventually things will even out, but it's gonna take a bit if you, if you put down, or and if you start regulating what's going on out there, being the sheriff of that world is a, is a full-time job. So you got a lot of work on your hands, right? So the way we look at it is we try and encourage the bugs that are gonna help us out. So spiders and praying mantis and wasps even, um, like the, the wasps that make like the mud nests and stuff, those we've never had an issue with any of them. If you have wasps that are in a hive, those are ones that can be dangerous. But the ones that are solitary, that are building these one-off little structures, we've never had an issue. They're, they've been around us like for, the, the entire time we've been gardening. So in regards to your gardening, how do you how do you navigate positive good bugs versus bad bugs, and then yeah. kill off the bad bugs and keep the good bugs? So the question is, how do you navigate the good bugs from the bad bugs? It's trying to encourage the bugs that are good. So if you see an issue like aphids, for example, or something that causes a lot of problems on plants, like they're little green, tiny little bugs that will completely devastate a plant in a matter of weeks, right? Ladybugs eat them. That's the number one thing they eat. So if you do things to encourage ladybugs, whether it's planting certain plants, and it's listed in the app, I don't remember what plants encourage ladybugs, but it's in the app. Or if you can order, you can actually order ladybugs on Amazon and then try and convince them to stick around by providing a bunch of water and showing them where the, where the aphids are. Um, like, there's things you can do to, to help encourage the good bugs, but most importantly, it's just don't spray any poison because then you're killing the good bugs. So those spiders are going everywhere. They're definitely gonna pick up the poison. Like, you know, like, and then a lot of these other bugs that you want around are, are gonna be wiped out. Um, and, and pretty much every bug that you think of has some sort of a nemesis out there that will help. So even if it's like June bugs, right? The Japanese beetle, there's a naturally occurring soil bacteria from Japan that you can buy that targets those the larva of the June bug. And is this information in the app? All in the app. Yeah, okay. Everything is in the app. Okay. So I've tried to back up everything in here to the app, but we've done a lot of research and we've compiled like 50 books at this point in this one app. So. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. What's the deal with the smart pots? Why would you use 
those opposed to a terracotta or Good plastic? question. Good question. Why, so why the smart pots instead of like a plastic container? So the first year that we started growing, we tried all the different methods. Um, we tried like building raised beds, we tried growing in the ground, we tried plastic containers. I had not seen these yet, so I didn't try those. And then everything in plastic containers died. Both like, it was like, I had a hard time keeping things alive, but like deep into the summer, because it would get too hot, and then they froze in the winter. And at that point, I swore off containers. So I'm not doing that again. And then I, um, I, I made a friend that was a professor at an OSU in the, in the soil science department, and he was raving about these things, talking about how um, when the roots hit the side, instead of in plastic containers, like they circle around, like you see what happens in a plastic container with roots, that, that doesn't happen in these smart pots. They stop and they form these tiny little root capillaries that suck in oxygen from the outside. So it's like a supercharged plant, and if this plant is able to pull oxygen from all around it, not just from the top, right? Also, uh, a great thing about these is watering is super simple because like we keep like kitty pools and things like that around and I'll just fill the kitty pool up with a couple inches of water and just set these aside in the summer. And the next tomato is gonna drink on that throughout the day and I just do that like, you know, every three or four days or however often it needs to be. So there's a balance of like overwatering, but it makes it easier to water in the summer because in Oklahoma, especially in the summer, it's very difficult to keep water in the without spending your whole day doing that. No, it's depends on the conditions. If it's like 100 degrees every day for three weeks, they're staying in the pool and I'm filling it up every day because they're, they're thirsty every day, right? But if it's the spring and it's 70s, then that's not even in the pool at all because we're getting rain and stuff and like I don't even need the pools. So but they're always there available on hand in case I need them. So um, if we're going on vacation, we'll maybe use it for someone else to you know, uh, help us keep the water and stuff like that too. Um, I would like to build an automated irrigation system again. Like we had one in our old house, I want to build one at this place now. Um, that's a lot more land and we'll see. I'll find one. Um, a little bit more about the smart pots. Um, so I also tried things as a comparison where they were directly in the smart pots. Um, versus being in like a raised bed right next to them. And we saw way different results between the two. So doing the exact same thing, like having them kind of right next to each other. I mean, there's always difference in like seeds, like you can get one seed stronger than the other, but we saw consistent results across a lot of different types of plants where they just did better than the ones that were in the raised bed. So um, we've also found they last longer because the wooden raised beds that we built broke down in three or four years. Um, and also when we moved, they all fell apart. We were to move all, like, how many big guy beds do we have? We have probably six, eight, something like that. There's like 15 up there. We have probably 15. Like we have a lot of these smart pots and we moved them all the way across town and they, they still held up. And it was really a cool thing because we moved into our house. Before we moved any of our stuff, we moved our garden. So when we moved into the house, our garden was already there growing. Like it's, we already have stuff going, right? So it makes it, we have an affordable garden and um, it's really cool. Right? We have a couple more to give away, don't we? We have three more tickets. All right, let's do that. Everybody have a ticket. Last call for tickets. Okay. All right, so. 442. 434. 429. All right. 454. Okay, so one more then? Okay, one more. 414. All right, and we're talking about all these plants. Um, let's talk about lettuce a little bit more, because you talked about romaine lettuce, but one thing about lettuce is there's three different types of lettuce. So romaine is like one type that we grow, and it does really well in the summer and in the cold. Uh, butter crunch is another variety that we grow that's uh, a different type of lettuce. It is probably my favorite to grow. So if you're looking for, for lettuce varieties, check out a video she did last week actually where she detailed all the, all the varieties we grow, why we grow certain types. Oh, it's fine. Um, and also I want to mention one more time, if you're, if you're interested to know any of this kind of stuff, check out our app, but really check out our YouTube channel because Barry has been putting out a video almost every day showing what we're growing from our garden, like exactly as we're planting, we're recording it, doing all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'll answer questions the rest of the time. And then, yeah. Uh, soil. Soil, great question. So a uh, couple different options. If you're doing like, so for these smart pots we did, we bought some soil from the nursery. 
And I do recommend getting it from a nursery or somewhere like that because they're going to have higher quality. And really, it's going to be fresher. If you go to like one of these big box stores, who knows how long that soil has been there. It probably isn't the highest quality. It's worth spending some money on. Um, but really, you can make it yourself. And that's what we do for everything in our garden. Uh, we just This is more convenient for what we're doing today. But for our garden, we're making it ourselves because it saves you so much money. Um, and it's a, a mix of, of three things in equal parts. Uh, the first ingredient is peat moss, and you can substitute peat moss for coconut core if you want, but coconut core is more expensive. Peat moss is about 11 98 at Home Depot, I think, for three cubic feet. Um, so that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is vermiculite, and you can substitute perlite if you can't find vermiculite. Um, you, you're going to want to buy a big bag of it. It comes in four cubic feet bags. You can find it at the nurseries. I know TLC had the had the had a good deal on it last time I saw it. Uh, organic OKC that's not too far from here up the road usually has a lot of it, and it's usually between 30 and 40 a bag. Um, that's the most expensive ingredient of it, um, and that's for a four cubic foot bag. So you're going to be making a bunch out of this, enough to fill probably just rough estimate 200 gallons this is just rough estimate i don't know if that's right but it's just like kind of based on the experience of what we've done i think that's about how many we get built for that and then the last ingredient is going to be compost so we get compost in bulk from uh minic materials that's where we've gotten all of our compost from they have four different types of compost and i like that because i mix them all together and really the thing i'm looking for in compost is getting as many different sources as i can to mix together. Because if you buy compost from just one source or just made from just one source, like just made from cows, for example, right? It's not gonna be as well-rounded as one that is made from like vegetable scraps. And like, if you mix all those together, you get all different pieces of it. Think of like you're feeding a diet to your plants. The compost is the food. And you don't wanna give it just cow. It needs some vegetables and other stuff too. If you wanna give it a well-rounded diet, like, that's kind of how you need to think about it. And the easiest way to accomplish that is just to get from it minute materials because then you can buy like, all the different quantities. So if you have a truck, it's really convenient because it'll just dump it in the back of it. If you don't, you can take like some buckets and they'll sell by the bucket or by, uh, I think they even have bags there where you can buy like bags of it too. It's just, you're gonna be spending, anytime you're buying a bag, you're spending way more money. Like the price goes way up. So if you can borrow a truck from somebody or anything like that, you're always gonna be better off. Um, if you have land, like we got like 30 tons of it delivered when we first moved in, that's gonna last us a very long time. It is an investment, but now I have a giant pile of compost that's gonna last me for several years. So that's the way I look at it. Um, so you just mix all those three together in equal parts. Again, we have a video that details like how to do all this. Um, you could do it on a smaller scale too. It's just gonna cost you more money by buying the bags. So um, do not buy compost from the store though. Like the, anything that's in a bag of compost is not gonna be good. You, you wanna get it from, from some sort of bulk source. And you're saying Minic? Minic, M-I-N-N-I-C-K. They have locations all across the city. They've got like four or five locations. So there should be one that's close to you wherever you live. Um, seating square, I didn't talk about this thing, so uh, can you pull it out for me? So we use this device quite a bit too. Uh, we do square foot gardening. If you've never heard of square foot gardening, it's this gardening method where instead of you planting in like these long rows with these big gaps in between, you take like a four by four bed and you divide it into squares where every square is planted according to each, each plant's like requirements. So lettuce is 16 per square. So every red dot is lettuce. Beans are gonna be nine per square. So they're every yellow, um, like eventually you down to something that's one per square, but it, it helps you kind of space that out and visualize it. Um, we love using these things, uh, we sell them as well. So if you're interested in those, check them out. We have videos how we show how to use them. They're very handy though, especially if you are at all OCD like I am, you know, things to be all spaced out. Our garlic is perfect and spaced out. It makes me very happy every time I look at it. So. Yeah, and we have a box of them here today too, if you like to follow. So. Sorry, what, type, what is it called? Is it's, all, it's called the seating square. Do you have a question, Mary? So, like mint will spread out. Yes, like, good, but that's a good point about mint, yes. Will the other things that you've had today stay pretty solitary, or are there other things that are just wanderers? Yeah, the only thing you got to worry about out of this bunch is going to be mint. But you do got to worry about mint. You're not playing it in like a 4x4 raised bed, and you have a 4x4 mint by next winter. <laughs> Maybe you want that. Maybe you want that. But uh, we actually had a battle of the mint in a bed, where we planted seven different types of mint, and we'll see what happened. It was chaos, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, 
We're also selling smart pots. I haven't mentioned that. I'm not going to sell anything, y'all. I'm a developer. I just like coding things. So um, we are selling smart pots up here as well. We have the different sizes, like 25, 20, 15, 20, 10. It's like a sports announcement. Yeah, so we've got all of those up here too. Can we give them all away? Give all those away? Oh, we have one more to give away. Awesome. So we have a big one to give away. Smart Pots gave us one of these blue ones too. It's a 15 gallon Smart Pot. So I love these sizes because you can grow pretty much anything. Once you get to 15 or above, you can grow anything in there. Um, and then they're still portable. You can still move around, especially with these handles. You know, so let's draw a winner for this one. 416. Last call for 416. 426. Woo! All right. What a winner. Do you know what you're going to grow in it? I'm sorry I put you on the spot. Potatoes, too. That was a good, yes. We Pretty much all of our potatoes that we grow are in these type of smart pots because uh, the problem we have with growing potatoes in the ground is we break a lot of them while we're trying to harvest them. Um, and, but with these, it's really cool because you just dump them out into a barrel and then the kids, it's like an Easter egg hunt. They're searching for potatoes and like, it's, uh, it's like a whole day event of just going through all of our, our smart pots and dumping them out. So, I did not mention potatoes. Thanks, thanks for whoever brought that up. Thank you. Yes, you have a question? So, um, you can go either way. If you want to plant it by itself, then uh, the app will tell you what size smart pot goes with that plant. Um, we have that as one of the fields. But you can also, like if you have a big bag like Mini, which is like one of the like, bigger round ones, or like a Junior, so it's 25 gallon, 50 gallon, or 100 gallon, which are like, you know, you can do a mix of things in there. So like we have one that's an herb garden. So it's like rosemary, sage, oregano, it's all, like, everything in Italian seasoning in one garden, basically. Um, and then we have another one that's like a mix of greens. So it's like some chard, some spinach, so that like when we go out to the garden, we can either have a source where there's like a bunch of different stuff in one place, so if I'm building a salad, I don't have to go far. Or if I need a bunch of spinach, I have a bed that's all spinach too. So we try and have one that's a mix and then a dedicated bed for each thing too, so we have overflow and backups. That's typically how we do it. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, if you're just starting out, can I recommend a couple of different plants and smart pots? So, any of the herbs you, that I gave out today, those are all really easy to start with. So like my number one recommendation is start an herb garden. Look at your time and seasoning, everything that's in the ingredients, get that. Like start with that. Because then you're gonna feel good every time you use it. Like yes, I'm like, you're, I'm eating healthy, I'm saving money, you're like, you know, like, so that's gonna get your momentum going. And then from there, go, and maybe at the same time, try some spinach. I thought spinach was boring before I started growing it. I got it on my Subway sandwich because that's what the health people told me to do. I never enjoyed doing it. I just, I never tasted it, so I thought, why not, right? Once I started growing it myself, I started tasting it for the first time because every variety has its own flavor. And some of them have like a nutty flavor, and now I'm like a spinach craze lunatic. Like, I love spinach. Like, I collect spinach varieties like I do with the garlic. I, I mostly give it everything I do, but spinach is one of the big ones where, like, we try and grow all these varieties and see what tastes best, and like, and it has like a really unique flavor, and like, and that flavor comes with health benefits. So I really recommend spinach. Kale also is very easy to grow. I don't love kale as much. It doesn't taste as good as spinach to me. But in the winter, the cool thing about these greens is they they develop sugar to to stay to, to be able to survive the winter longer. That's how they survive the winter is they put they put sugar in their leaves, and that makes it where they don't freeze. Them. So they taste sweet in the winter. So that's what I'm trying to say. Things with like carrots too. So if you go carrots in the fall and harvest them in the winter, they'll be the sweetest carrots you've ever had. Because that's how plants, you know, survive the winter. So um, a, lot, a lot of people that maybe have kale for the first time, like in the summer from a grocery store, well, it's going to be kind of bitter at that point, you know? And it's not going to taste very good. So eating these things in, in, the, in the cool season is going to help. Uh, garlic also is very easy to grow. Start with that because it's pretty cool to grow that. Um, once, you, once it comes spring, grow a pepper plant, because that's a really cool experience because you get 100 peppers at least off of one plant, right? And they're pretty easy to take care of. Um, 
So like especially a jalapeno, like this jalapeno varieties are pretty resistant to disease and stuff. They're they're pretty easy. Tabasco peppers do really well here. So like I love making my own Tabasco sauce and stuff like that. Like that's how we have a lot of fun with it, is making our own sauces and like doing all that kind of thing. Um, zucchini is gonna be really easy to grow until the squash bugs find you. So the first year that we grew a garden, like the squash bugs didn't know we were there yet, and we had all this zucchini and it was amazing. And then it's been a battle ever since then. So you might as well get that in while you can, before they find you. Cucumbers are pretty easy to grow also. Um, hopefully that gives you a good mix of stuff to kind of think about starting. But really the, I get the biggest advice, and Carrie has a really good video that talks about like what to start with. But I think we really focus on like, what do you like to get the store? You know, what do you like to eat? What sounds cool to grow? Like what's gonna pique your interest? Because that plant needs your help to survive. So it's, you gotta trick your brain into being excited about that plant or just be another plant. But my first attempt at gardening before Karen and I got together lasted about two weeks and then I forgot about my garden and then I, I was like, oh, I'm not, gar I'm not a gardener. So like, I understand like, it, you know, so keep it small, something you can focus on and really like, because you gotta make that connection of why you should grow. And once you start eating it, you'll get it. And now it's, and then it'll become part of your life. And careful, you might end up buying five acres and get a bunch of goats like we have, because it's kind of taking us into a tailspin. But it's a good lifestyle. I definitely recommend it. We are, we're over on time. Okay. We're over on time. So if you have any other questions, go ahead and come up and ask. I can. We're selling smart pots too, so if you want to buy them, come on up here. We can sell them to you. That's everything. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate you all being here and being so supportive. Thank you.